Hello, I am Cody Baker from the online section of CNT 6418, and I'm going to give a presentation on Kali Linux tutorial focusing on Wireshark. We're going to go over some uses of Wireshark and with a lot of emphasis on the application uh, for how digital forensics investigators can use Wireshark today. We're going to go over an introduction to Wireshark first. Then we're going to look at analyzing packet captures, basically how to use Wireshark and what features Wireshark has that will help you in this endeavor. And then we're going to briefly discuss some use cases. Um, and then we're going to actually look at examples and, and I'll give a demo of how to use Wireshark in some cases. Then we're going to use, have a conclusion slide to wrap things up. So Wireshark is basically just a packet capture program that sniffs networks, that sniffs the network. Depending on how your network is set up, you might be limited in what you can sniff. But uh, that is, uh, that's, I can't go into that much detail since I don't have enough time for that. But basically just know that anything data that is sent to and from a computer, Wireshark can capture that data. Wireshark is based on T-Shark. T-Shark actually came before Wireshark, and then Wireshark was made to enhance T-Shark so that it includes a GUI or a graphical user interface. So that's a lot more simple for a common user to uh, interface with. So it can capture packets live, or you can analyze saved packet capture files that, you know, a lot of tutorials will have packet capture files or .pcap files that you can download and look at and use Wireshark to kind of practice on. So this is really great for analyzing logs. Uh, most companies nowadays are logging everything that goes on in their networks. So if you've got a PCAP file that from months ago, you can just use Wireshark to analyze all the data and, and packets that were being transferred um, during that whatever specified time period was. So analyzing packet captures, Wireshark does this. Uh, the main feature of Wireshark is the filtering options. There are a lot of filtering options, so many that I, I do not have time to go over all of them. I encourage you to do a Google search on all the different filtering options. So basically, you can query the data or the packets however you want. If you are looking just for HTTP requests, which is all the web server requests, you literally can just type in HTTP and it will show you all the packets that are using the HTTP protocol. Or if you're looking for a specific IP address, you can just type in IP.address equals 192.168.0.1 and it'll show you all the packets that are sent to or from that specific IP address. Wireshark also shows you a lot of statistics so if you want to look at all the IP addresses that it finds in this packet capture file or maybe the live packet capture that you did it'll show you all the addresses and it'll even go and try and find domain names that are associated with that address. You can look at protocol hierarchies to determine what are all the different protocols being used and if you want to get more information on HTTP um, requests, you can look at the load distribution to see who is sending requests and who is responding to those requests. So let's just go over to my Kali machine real quick and kind of get an idea of some of these features that are being used. So you'll see here that I have an example trace loaded into my Wireshark program. And like I said, if I want to just find HTTP packets, I literally can just type in HTTP and now all the packets that are using the HTTP protocol will show up here. And let's exit out of that. If I want to go to statistics, maybe I want to see all the addresses that are being used. So here's all the addresses, the IP addresses, and their associated domain names. So like Akamai is a very common uh, and popular content distribution network that is uh, used by like Facebook and all those other organizations. And you see Google, many different Google um, and Amazon uh, IP addresses that are being used. So it'll show you all those that it finds in that packet capture. It'll also show you all the services being used. So here's all the ports that are being used in one way or another, in one form or another, on this packet capture. It can also show you MAC addresses. So you see here Ethernet addresses, 144 different entries being used, and it'll show you the actual address along with the name of that address. <clears throat> you can also go through HTTP 
and look at the load distribution. So maybe you want to see what servers there are, what web servers are actually responding, um, what clients may be requesting uh, uh, services from the web server. If you look at the statistics and go to protocol hierarchy, you can actually see that like IPv4 is about 99% of all the packets. So basically every packet in this packet capture file is using IPv4. That makes sense because IPv6 is not very commonly used right now. And out of those, about 50% are UDP packets and another 50 are, are the TCP packets. And like under TCP, you can see that there's some telnet protocols going on, SSH and HTTP. Um, those are the different kind of protocols being used. So that's just a little quick example of, of how the filtering and statistics are shown. The follow TCP streams um, feature, I'll, I'll get into that a little more during the examples portion. So some use cases, uh, as I already said, companies log everything nowadays. So any, any packets that are being sent across their network are most likely going to be stored on some storage server farm that they have. So that way, if any event ever happens, they can go back to those packets and see what happened. For example, that you know, in network forensics, you, you might need to find information on an attack that occurred months or even years ago. So if, if you realize that a hack, you, that your company has been hacked a few months ago, and you can find the time span between when that happened, you, you, are, you have logs of all the packets that you have captured across your network, you can just go back to that log, those logs get the, capture, uh, the packet capture files and just load those into Wireshark and use Wireshark to kind of filter through and look at some statistics and maybe try and figure out how did this attack happen or what did this attack do? Or what was actually compromised? You might also want to just look at communication between two different machines to gather live evidence. So if your company thinks that there's an employee that is accessing websites they shouldn't be accessing, you might just hire, they might hire an investigator to sniff their computer, all the data that's coming to and from their computer live right then and there and catch them in the act, so to speak, of uh, if they ever access any uh, specific websites. So you can look at like the HTTP filtering to, to do that. So that's just a few examples of use cases and there's so many more that I'm sure you can come up with. So let's actually look at some examples and, and show a demo of how we might use this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this capture file. And what I'm going to do is actually show a live capture file just to show what my IP address is on this Kali machine. Right now, it's this is what I have on the Kali machine. And I have another machine here, which is the Metasploitable. It's a Metasploitable machine. Uh, I'm not going to go into details what this is. It's just basically another computer. You can think of it that way. And I'm going to go ahead and log on to it using my MSF admin logon. Oh, whoops. Wrong password there. Okay, so now I've logged on. And let's just kind of look at, you know, what's use the ls command to see what files I have. Okay, so there's some files. Let's look at cat hello.txt, see what's in that file. So that's what's in there. And let's also look at, you know, what is my IP address just to make sure. So you can see that my IP address on the Kali machine, on the Metasploitable machine is .128.1. And this is across the F0, the F0 interface. So let's go ahead and tell Wireshark to use the F0 interface and start capturing packets. So the, these two machines are connected to each other, but they're isolated from everything else. So there's not going to be any packets there right now that Wireshark can capture. Let's go ahead and ping my Metasploitable machine to make sure that I can actually talk to it. It looks like I can. And you can see Wireshark has generated some information here. It's captured those ping requests. Now I'm going to use Telnet to actually log in to my Metasploitable machine from my Kali machine. So it's going to go and request a terminal from Metasploitable. And once it figures out who my Kali machine is, 
Metasploitable will give me a terminal. And I can actually log in with my MSF admin, log in username, type in a password, and log in as if I was actually at the Metasploitable machine, but I'm doing this from my Kali machine. And you can see like if I do ls, I can see the files there, I can concatenate the hello to the screen, and there's what was in the uh, hello.txt file. And let's go ahead and log out. So during this whole time, Wireshark has been capturing all that Telnet data. Now Telnet goes through plain text. So I can actually, if I was an investigator, I could go through each one of these packets and get the data that was being sent every single time. But Wireshark has this awesome feature called follow TCP stream. If you just right click on any Telnet or TCP communication, you can do follow TCP stream and then it will pop up this little display and it'll put all those packets in the stream together so you can have it in a little more friendly interface there so you can read it easier. So all the red is what my Kali machine sent to my Metasploitable machine and all the blue is what my Metasploitable machine sent to my Kali machine. So you can see how my Metasploitable machine sent that little login uh, interface there first. Then I typed in my MSF admin now, what happened here is, is it's not, I didn't actually type in, as you can see here, I didn't type in MMSFFFAADB. I didn't do double characters there. But what I did was Telnet only shows letters that are being, or ASCII characters or information that's being sent from Metasploitable. It doesn't show what I typed in there. So when I send an M, a blue M is going to come back saying it's from Metasploitable to give me feedback of what I just typed. So there's always going to be a double of what I type in there, except for the password. You notice that here, the password, I don't see anything on the password. That's because Metasploitable is not going to echo back what I type to it, but it is going to receive what I typed. And even though it, don't see, it doesn't show it here, the network actually did see it, does see it. So this is why you don't use Telnet, because it, it's all plain text. So if anyone is sniffing that network, they can see what my password is and my username. And then now they have username and password to get into my machine, which is not good. So the rest of this file should be pretty self-explanatory there. Um, you should always use SSH instead of Telnet. Just real quick, we can look at if I use SSH to log on to my Metasploitable machine, it's going to go and do basically the same thing that Telnet is going to do, asking for a terminal. And then it's going to soon here ask me for a username or a password for that MSF admin. And then if I do the same thing, I, I logged on and I can ls and look at what's there and I can cat my hello.txt and then let's exit out. And then if we come back here to Wireshark, we can see that there was a whole bunch of SSH protocol being used. And if we use the same follow TCP stream, now, instead of actually being able to read what was being sent across the network, I only see a bunch of gibberish, which is the whole point, because all of these, everything that was sent was encrypted. So, um, now for an investigator's point of view, that might be okay. Telnet would obviously be, you know, a gold mine there, because then you don't only confirm that there was communication, but you know what the communication was. But maybe, for instance, all you're trying to prove is that there was some sort of communication between two machines. So even though I don't know what it says, I do know from Wireshark that it was from this IP address to this IP address, which again, for many cases, that might be all you need to prove is that just a communication did exist. And maybe at a particular time, for instance, you can see the time here, maybe at this time, that's all I need to prove, right? So um, that's just one example. Let's go to another example that I think is a little bit more fun. So stop capturing packets. Go ahead and close that. And I'm going to open up this RTP example. RTP is a real-time transfer protocol. And it's used for voice and audio data. You can see all these RTP protocol packets being used. And Wireshark has this awesome little feature called telephony VoIP calls. Now, I bet you if you work at a company, a, a fairly big company, you're probably using a Cisco VoIP phone. Well, every time you use that phone, 
when you talk into the phone, it's sending that digital, it's digitizing your voice and sending that digital data across the same line that all the other network traffic is going through. So Wireshark can pick that up as well and it can tell when a phone call has happened. So like here, this phone call started at this time, ended at that time, and here's the IP address of the initial speaker. And what Wireshark can also do is actually take all those packets that happened during the phone conversation, take the data from it, put it all together into some audio files, and actually play back what the phone conversation was. So like here, let's play this one. So I hope you can see then the benefit this can bring to a, a digital forensics investigator because if maybe there's an employee who's been you know disgruntled against another employee and he, he's been giving death threats but you can't prove it because he's been only doing it over the phone for some reason. I don't know why, it seems pretty stupid, but Maybe he is, and, and you find uh, you, some packets of a phone conversation he had where he was giving death threats over the phone. Well, guess what? Now I have evidence for that if I'm using the uh, RTP protocol. So I hope this uh, gives some light on how Wireshark can be used. Let's go back to the slides here. So in conclusion, Wireshark is a very useful tool for an investigator. There's so many ways to use it, and it, it, it just gives so much information across what's happening over the network. There's also a lot more that I have not shown you here that I don't have time to go into. I myself am not even a master of Wireshark. Maybe that's a lot to learn in that regard. So I encourage you to use Google to research more about Wireshark and how to use it. Just as a note, it can be installed on any operating system, not just Kali. It's already pre-installed on Kali, which is nice but it can work on a Mac and Windows as well. And Wireshark though, from an investigator's point of view, is not always the best for large PCAP files, large packet captures. If you think of a large company like Google or Apple or Boeing or something like that, you're not generating just hundreds of packets per minute, you're generating hundreds of thousands of packets per minute for networks that large on in your company. So, if, even if you wanted to take just a few minutes of, of a packet capture and put it into Wireshark, Wireshark is probably going to crash or hang because it's just too much data for it to handle, especially because it's trying to present it to the user in a graphical way. Now, T-Shark might be a little better option because T-Shark doesn't care about the graphical side. It only cares about the raw data, and you can crunch numbers on that raw data all day long, right? It's a lot less processing power. So just keep that in mind. But this has been a tutorial on how to use Wireshark. I hope it's been very helpful for you and uh, you can see how great of a tool this really can be for a digital forensics investigator. Thanks.